Okay, so this week we will finish our book, The London Eye Mystery. So this week we've got quite a few chapters to get through. We're going to be doing that in the class read sessions. We're also going to be looking at a couple in guided reading sessions as well. And although Friday is a bank holiday, available on Friday will be the final two chapters of the book. So it's up to you whether you read that on Friday or you could um, hear that on the Thursday of the weekend, however you want to. So let's see. We've still got an awful lot to find out between now and then. So, chapter 27, Biker Hell. Remember that Head had just tried to negotiate his way through the London tube system and he'd arrived at this conference or event centre. So, through bouncing hail, which was of an average about 12 millimetres in diameter, across a busy road loomed a big building with a banner plastered over it. Motorcycle and scooter show. The hailstones died away, the last globules tapping my head as, and shoulders as I crossed over. Inside the main entrance, people were crushed up together. There was a person counter by the ticket desk, registering the daily numbers. Today's figure was 19,997 and rising. I'd never seen such a crowd. It was mostly men in black leathers, with silver studs and black glossy orbs, helmets on their head or under their arm. I felt as if I'd been beamed from Earth onto an intergalactic space station. Were they men or clones? They laughed, argued and shouted. I wasn't sure about them. They looked like the rough boys in our school who go round in gangs, and if you come up against them in the corridor, you'd better turn and run away. These men seemed worse than those boys. But they didn't spit at me or elbow me in the ribs or call me a neek. So mm, they ignored me. So I queued for a ticket. Then I saw a team of security people standing by the barriers, checking hand luggage, sweeping people with handheld explosive detectors like they do at airports in the London Eye. Some people were made to empty their bags and pockets. What made me stare was what was written on the T-shirts. Cat and I had got it right. Front line security. I know a lot of you guessed that last week as well, so really well done for doing that. It was the same T-shirt as the one worn by the strange man. Only this time I could see the missing letters. I scoured the faces of the guards at the entrance, but the strange man wasn't among them. I bought a ticket and presented it. One of the guards waved a bomb detector around my body and motioned me forward. As I went through a metal turnstile, the person counter clicked to a new daily number. 20,054. I stopped. T is letter 20 in the alphabet, E is letter 5, and D is letter number 4. It was as if the person counter had registered me by my name. 25 and 4. Ted! Perhaps it was my lucky day. Perhaps I would find Cat. And perhaps we'd find the strange man. And perhaps this would lead us to Salim. Perhaps. Perhaps nothing. As I went through into the big hall, I stared. Engines revved. Tires screeched. Film tracks blared. Flights, lights flashed. Music thumped. Everywhere was the smell of petrol and polish. The names of bikes were displayed on every stand. Hondas, Yamahas, Suzukis. One stand said, Welcome to Biker Paradise. It was more like Biker Hell. The colours were chrome, black, electric blue. The noises were purring engines and throbbing drum beats. A giant screen showed motorcycle racers coming straight at you. Waving girls in black leather bikinis sat on bikes that hung from the air and went nowhere. I didn't know where to look. People kept thrusting leaflets at me and sticking stickers on my sweatshirt. One woman gave me a raffle ticket. It said, free to enter, win a set of ladies' leatherettes. Whatever they were, I didn't want them. I wanted cat. I walked among the loud stands. A man approached me with, a, with studded gloves and tattoos up his neck. He started talking to me as if he'd known me all my life. He used a lot of words I didn't know. GSX, disc brakes, Harleys, V-Rod, VFR, Kawasaki. He paused. Maybe you're the Toronto type, he said, uh, the tornado type, he said. He put a hand on my arm and pointed to a model overhead with a silver picture on it of a swirling twister just about to touch down. Hmm, I said, my hand flapping. You're right, it's the best, he said. The creme de la creme of motorbikes. The one and only, the... I ran. Then an announcement came over the loudspeaker. 
Come to the takeoff ramp in Hall 2 for the freestyle jumper display. Hurry, the show starts in two minutes. There was a general movement in one direction. I found myself being carried along into another big hall. In the centre was a huge ramp. It looked like you would have needed mountaineering equipment to climb it. I stopped in mid-air like a road to nowhere. A terrific drone of an internal combustion engine started up. It turned over with a whirring noise, becoming ever higher pitched. Then I saw it, a flash of chrome, a white helmet, a missile-like saw, a bike about to jump. It parted company with the top of the ramp. It continued its flight up. It almost grazed the roof. Then it came down and down. I had to shut my eyes because whoever was on it was sure to be smashed up and dead, and I didn't want to see it. The crowd clapped and cheered. I opened my eyes. The bike had landed metres away. There was a bad feeling in my esophagus. My hands were over my ears. The driver was a madman. He pulled up, got off his bike and took off his helmet. Long blonde locks fell out. It was a woman, not a man. Male or female, depending on how you look at it. The audience gasped. Then there was more clapping, cheers, people thumbing their feet, uh, thumping their feet. The woman laughed, shook out their hair. The woman laughed, shook out her hair and waved a leather hand in the air. She re remounted her bike and zoomed back to the start. Another drone started, another competitor, another zoom, another crazy jump, freestyle, then another. On the last jump, a miracle happened. I saw Cat. She was only a few metres away from me, up, by the, up front by the railing, staring up at the jumpers. Her eyes and mouth were wide and round like three flying saucers. I went up to her and pulled the sleeve of her fur-collared jacket. She didn't notice at first. I pulled it again. She spun round, her eyes opened wider, then scrunched up, and her face folded up small and mean, and she bellowed so loud in my ear it hurt. Bloody hell, Ted, what are you doing here? Okay, chapter 28. Meetings. Cat, I said. My head went off to one side. Even though Cat's voice was like a supersonic boom splitting my eardrum, I was glad. Mr Shepherd says to remember to smile when you greet people, so I smiled. Cat? Cat looked all around, all around. Her voice dropped to a hiss. Are you on your own? Yes. Act alone. Mum, they're not with you. No. They're still at home. Yes. You didn't give me away. No. She hugged me. Go bro. So where do you think we are? My hand flapped. I stopped it by holding it down with my other hand. Not at Tiffany's cat, I said. They think... They think we've gone swimming. Cat looked at me, her head wagging like one of those toys that sit in the back of the cars. Another lie, Ted. One of these days you'll be nearly normal. I told her about finding my way to the tube, how I'd cracked the missing letters, how I'd phoned frontline security and spoken to the temp. I met her. Cat said, I went round there in person. Her name's Claudette. She smokes charisma cigarettes. She mentioned you, I said. She said you'd been looking for the same man and Cat... What? That was a good lie you told. Which one? The one about the asthma inhaler. Yeah, I was proud of that. It worked too. She told me his name. Christy, and where he was. Then she told me all about her love life. She said she was bored of hell, she filed her fingernails, chewed her gum and smoked all at once. And guess what else? What? She offered me a fag. Hmm. I took it too. Hmm. Don't hmm me, Ted. I didn't smoke it, not really. I had a puff or two, but it wasn't my brand. It tasted like... A cow shed. We walked around the first hall together. Cat didn't seem to mind me being there. Her eyes darted everywhere. She whispered, Oh, what I'd have to do to have a bike of my own. She started picking up the biker language. Honda's VFR. Bulls, Firebolt, Goosey, she muttered, dragging me around the stands. I could hardly keep up. She pointed at the metallic paintwork, admiring the biggest, fastest models. She was in biker paradise. I was in biker hell. Why, I wondered. Couldn't we have tracked the strange man to somewhere more tranquil? A flower or antique show, maybe? Or somewhere really interesting, like the science museum? Then we saw him. Him. He was standing six metres away in the same clothes he'd worn the day at the London and I, minus the jacket, talking into a two-way radio. Cat dragged me behind a stand. I tugged away from her. Don't let him see you, she hissed. Why not? I'm handling this one by myself. But, no buts. I'm coming too, Cat. No, you're not. That's an order. An order? Yeah, I can give them because I'm older. And wiser, you said. Rubbish. You did, Cat. You said you needed my brains. Cat's nostrils quivered. 
She does that when she's about to erupt like a super volcano. Then she forgot and gripped me instead. He's walking this way, she whispered. He was right in front of us. Cat stepped forward. Excuse me, sir, she called. The man was talking to his radio. He turned round, saw Cat, put up a hand and went on talking. We waited. Over and out, he said into the radio. He stared straight at Cat. What can I do for you, young lady? He said. Are you lost? And he smiled. It was a smile I didn't like. One eyebrow went, one eyebrow went up. His head tilted. He looked at Cat up and down. Then he noticed me, my hand flapping up and my head was off to the side. His eyes opened wide, his mouth parted slightly. Then he looked over his shoulder and shifted from one foot to another. A second later, his face changed back to a smile. A nanosecond flicker. You lost, he repeated. The cat smiled. No, she said. Oh, go on then, have fun. We're not lost, Cat explained. But we know somebody who is. Oh. We thought you might be able to help. If you've lost somebody, go to the information desk. They'll make an announcement. He didn't get lost here. He got lost two days ago at the London Eye. The man shrugged. So, I mean, really lost. The police are looking for him. It was just after you came up to us and gave us that ticket, remember? The man stared at us for a long time. I looked at his eyes. They narrowed slightly. The pupils seemed to get smaller. The eye, he said. So that's where I've seen you before. I never forget a face. You remember? Now I do. I'm frightened of heights, you see. I get terrible vertigo. You're the kids I gave the ticket to, aren't you? But I don't know anything about your lost friend. Fancy our meeting up again. Coincidence, huh? I was about to tell him about the letters on his T-shirt, but Cat elbowed me, which means shut up. Yeah, coincidence, she said. Do you like motorbikes? Yeah, Cat said. They're great. It's a fantastic show this year. Best ever. Did you see the freestyle jumps? Yeah. Did you like them? They're awesome. If I were you, I'd go back to Hall 2. They're giving lessons on the lighter scooters in a minute or two. Really? You'll be zooming around the cones in no time at all. Honest? Sure thing. Off you go. Talk to my mate John in there. He'll get you on a bike first if you mention me. Hey, thanks. Don't mention it. I hope you find your friend. He saluted us with his radio, smiled and walked off. Hmm, I said. Cat's head went off to one side. Her face fell. Hell, she said. We stood together, jostled by passers-by, and watched a strange man disappear into the crowd just as he'd done at the London Eye. Dead end, Cat said. I might have guessed. Guess what, I asked. It was the road to nowhere. The road to nowhere, I repeated. Stop repeating everything I say. Let's check out those scooter lessons. She dragged me back to the second hall and found the man called John. I watched as she mounted a scooter, helmeted. She rode away. She wobbled, swerved, revved and giggled. My, flan my hand flapped up every time she turned because it looked like she was going to come off and break her neck. She wound around the coast and gathered speed. I watched. I shut my eyes and put my hand in my jacket pocket. Then I thought, Salim vanishing, the police searching, Aunt Gloria wailing, Mum raging, Cat crying, me lying, the strange man, his face and his eyes when he first saw us, the girl who did the first jump, vertigo and claustrophobia. My brain whirred like the bikes. I opened my eyes. Cat got off the scooter. She gave back the helmet. She came up to me, smiling with, wi eye with wide open eyes. Ted, that was great. You should try it. I shook my head. I quoted the graffiti that I'd seen on the tube. No way. I've been on the bike. I've been on that bike, and I've been round those cones, Ted. And do you know what? What? When I'm on that bike, that's when I can think. Think. Yeah, I was on the bike, and I couldn't hear the noise. The voices faded. I was on my own, really on my own. All I could hear were my thoughts. My thoughts about Salim. That's when I knew it, Ted. Knew what? Knew he was lying. That man, Christie, he was lying. I nodded. I'd reached the same conclusion by a process of deductive thought. My, our minds had met, which is a way to say that we're thinking the same thing at the same time, which was a rare thing between Cat and me. Yes, Cat, he was lying. Maybe it was because I'd become a liar myself that day, that they say it takes one to know one. I'd known almost as soon as he left us that he'd lied. It wasn't so much what he'd said as to how he'd tried to distract us from what we wanted to know. He was a mini Coriolis force, trying to deflect us. It had been another thing, a contradiction. At the London Eye, he'd said he'd decided against the ride because he was frightened of close-up spaces. Claustrophobia. Today, he'd said he was frightened of heights. Vertigo. We've got to find him again, Cat said, and make him tell us the truth. Yes, Cat, the truth. We're a team, you and I. Let's go, Ted. OK, so we'll leave it there for today. And let's think about what might be happening next. What is he hiding? What does he know?